your ownership of your money lies with your government. You don't own it, they can take it back. Uh, Visa's doing a pilot now with a stable coin called USDC in which the merchants get paid five seconds after the transaction. Now, there are no losers in that equation except except for people who hold that money along the way when it used to take three days. So that's instant settlement. Instant settlement. Good morning. I'm Matthew Burbage, and I'm joined this morning by a friend of Brainstorm, Stephen Boyke Sidley, who has just written a new book called It's Mine, How the Crypto Industry is Redefining Ownership. Very happy to have him in the studio this morning. Um, Stephen is, among many other things, he's an author, um, He's written about decentralized finance and the end of banks. Um, he is a professor of practice at the Johannesburg School of Business at UJ. And um, he is researching and teaching in blockchain and four R technologies. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Um, so let's dig into this book. Um, it's just come out. Um, it's... Um, and it's a very good book. I can uh, recommend it to everyone who's interested in ownership and cryptography. And it kind of talks about how cryptography enables uh, a different sort of ownership. And ownership is a bit of a slippery concept. Um, it's not entirely what one thinks. So, Stephen, I mean, why did you write this book and why now? Okay, so in... in, in 2020 or just towards 2021, we're we're finishing off me and Simon Dingle a book called Beyond Bitcoin, Decentralized Finance and the End of Banks. And I get this kind of moat in the corner of my eye, this thing that's disturbing my vision, disturbing my view of the horizon. And what it is, is people paying absurd amounts of money for questionable bunches of covered pixels called NFTs. I'm thinking to myself, what are, what are these people doing? Why would anybody pay this amount of money for something that ends up on a screen that doesn't end up with paint on your wall? And is this I, the apes? These yeah, are... these are, well, it was actually prior to the apes, but yeah, the apes are the, is, is the, the iconic NFT. And at the same time, I notice a bunch of other creatures staggering to life. Okay, there is the NFTs, and there is this thing called the metaverse, and people are talking about this aspirational thing called Web3, and of course there's DeFi, and there's cryptocurrencies, and there's stablecoins, and there's GameFi, and there's decentralized autonomous organizations. They're all very separate businesses, and I jump into life, and I'm thinking to myself, what is going on here? There's this explosion of life forms. And were you to ask somebody, even who's in the business, what is it that is the common threat between all of these things? They would all say the blockchain, and it struck me that it wasn't the blockchain. It was struck me that what was common about all of these things, which exist now as huge industries, is all of them enabled people or institutions a different way to own things. And the common fuel of that ownership was crypto sitting underneath. So when most people think about crypto, they think of Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies is just one small part of a very broad universe of crypto-fueled innovation. Some of the stuff happening out there has nothing whatsoever to do with currency at all, has nothing whatsoever to do with finance. So it seemed to me to be an interesting topic to grab and to talk about what this crypto is doing to what we think of as owning things. And I went in and dove down the rabbit hole of how ownership emerged from human society, why it was different then, what the different taxonomies were, and what has suddenly happened now that makes this as transformational as a technology as we have seen over the last 40 years. So, I mean, just to to take a step back, and I, and I suspect we're going to be taking a number of steps back in this in this in our in our talk here. Um, basically, I mean, as far as I understand it, and very my the simplistic understanding of it is that that crypto um, enables the transfer of value between two parties through hashing, hashing like a, a, a prime number mm. that then is a kind of handshake between you and I. And that's, so it's, 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 it's a, it's using hashing 
that, that's, am I right about that? Yeah, hashing is one part of the, the mathematics. There are many other bits and pieces in the mathematics. And once you start going down into the weeds of, of the, the encryption algorithms and, and the hashing and the asymmetric cryptography, you can get buried and never come up again. So let me try and put it differently. Is that the world in which we live now, uh, probably for the last thousand years or more, your ownership of stuff, I'm, not, I'm talking about any stuff, is usually determined by somebody else or is in the custody of somebody else or is attested to by somebody else. Let me give you an example. Your ownership of your identity was appointed to you when you got the to when you were born and the hospital had a birth registration certificate which turned into a birth certificate, which turned into a passport, which turned into an IPD book, which turned into a student card and on and on. Your ownership of your money lies with your government. You don't own it. They can take it back as they did in Cyprus in 2013 and Lebanon, I think, in 2017. They can debase that money by printing more. You don't own the money. Most people think they own sure. the money. They don't. You don't own your computer. Your computer is attested to by the receipt that you got from the internet connection. They are the ones that say you own it. And if you lose that computer and you don't have the receipt, you try to get the insurance back from it. You have to go to somebody else, the internet connection. You say, please go through your database and find me the original receipt. It turns out that we own almost nothing. And the reason we own almost nothing is that we delegate third parties to take care of the ownership on our behalf. Banks being the most important, insurance companies, financial institutions, lawyers, accountants, your mother, the government. Everything is in the hands of people except you. And when you lose that stuff or it gets seized from you illegally, it is often, not always, often difficult to get back again. There are examples of people who have lost their birth identity and they are non-citizens. So what happened with that world, which is called, we live in the world of title ownership. We have titles mm. which are written up by other people, attested to by other people, sometimes in the custody of other people. The great transformational magic of crypto, which is the hashing and the digital signatures and all of that sort of stuff, is that you didn't need the attestation or custody of a third party. The ownership was guaranteed by the mathematics. That's all one has to know about it in the same way as two and two equals four and can't be argued against. So you no longer need an attester or a bank or uh, an attorney or, or a state or a birth certificate in principle. I mean, there are great legacy systems which are resisting that move, but it is now possible to own something without having a third party attest. Okay, so like, so, so, so we're talking about identity here. So then, um, and that those, so identity and ownership are obviously Two sides of the related, same yeah. coins. So, I mean, how would a how would a sovereign identity program work, and why haven't we got one at the moment? Well, we have, we've got some. There are some kind of competing ecosystems, but nothing ubiquitous. Yes, and there's there's except for some experiments in places like Estonia and Singapore, there are not no blockchain related ownerships. So, so to, to say again, your your ownership now exists because of a single document at the top of the tree when you were born and it devolves down. It has been chipped away at, for instance, in India now you can have I an don't. identity. Yeah, you can have an identity simply by being alive and you, you, you arrive there. That, that's the digital identity system that yeah, they've got. Yeah, it's not on a blockchain, but, but it's starting to move in the, in the direction of sovereign ownership. There are a couple of very well-known... Um, protocols and standards that are being proposed and to a certain extent accepted in the crypto world. One of them is called Sovereign, which I write about in the book. By the way, the chapter of the book is called Owning Yourself. That's ground zero. That is S-O-V-R-I-N. Yes, S-O-V-R-I-N. And they have built a blockchain-based ecosystem. And then right on the other side of the philosophical spectrum is Vitalik Buterin, who is the developer of Ethereum, the second largest blockchain. And he has come up with an idea called the Soulbound Token which is a very artsy name to say your soul is embedded in this token. Now, why are these things important? It is important because your identity is not actually your birth. Your identity is your mother, your father, your friends, your siblings, your colleagues, your institutions, your movie that you went to, what you own, what you think about things, whether you were in a bad mood in the morning yesterday and you're in a good mood today. Your identity is, number one, dynamic, depending on circumstances at a particular moment in time, and it's ever-changing. And it depends on many, many things. And what you choose to reveal of yourself to somebody who wants to know your identity should be at your discretion. 
So I'll give you an example. If you are a young man courting a woman, what you choose to reveal of yourself to your prospective mother-in-law is not the same thing that you'll reveal to yourself if somebody is trying to hire you for a job or recruiter. But all you've got is your birth certificate or your driver's license as your testimonials as to who we are, and somebody can take your ID number and look up as to whether you have a criminal record. These crypto initiatives allow you to build an identity in a token that only you have the key for and to release pieces of that identity via what's called a public key to anybody who wants to see it and relieve, release different pieces to yourself of yourself. At your I suppose... It's gonna it's gonna be a slow genesis of this thing the way it gets rolled out because there's no winner as as yet in this. I mean, do we just wait until one gets big enough and is that gonna then become the de facto standard? Yeah, so so that's exactly right. All of the stuff that I talk about in this book, not all of it, but a lot of it is um, in principle now possible, but in practice not here yet because of great legacy politics, regulations, policies that are sclerotic and can't move easily. For instance, let me give you the most obvious one, example of what you talk about. The title deed for your house. You own a house and the title deed is kept by the municipality and it is a, a inflexible thing. It's a piece of paper, if you've ever seen one, it says the earth number and your name and when it was bought and I think it has a price on it and one or two other things. And it's held in custody by the municipality. You have a copy, they have a copy. They are actually the official attester. How do you change that title deed into a token on the blockchain, which will be much safer, much faster to move around, you don't have to go to the municipality, um, and much more flexible because in the current title deed, let's say when you died, you wanted your house to be left to your wife for the first week, your children for the second week, and your cousin when it rains. You hmm. can't do that because it's inelastic. With crypto ownership, you can define ownership in any way that you like because it's a computer program, so you can put whatever you like in there. In order to get a municipality to agree to move from their current regime to an NFT-based regime requires that you move political mountains, and it ain't going to happen, certainly not in South Africa, and it ain't going to happen in America, but in Estonia and those places who are on the sort of bleeding edge of digitizing and putting things on the blockchain, you will see this thing appearing, and then suddenly people will look at those places, the first three prototypes, and say, God, that is so easy and simple and secure and saves money and what, 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 and you will see the stuff opening up. How long, Matthew? This is a question of how long does it take to move political mountains, but once the damn wall breaks on some of the stuff, as it has with stable coins, for instance, or tokenization, you will see the stuff. Estonia is, I mean, a, <clears throat> a shining example of things. It seems sometimes half that the half the world's good ideas come from there, yeah. and, and 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 implementations actually as well. Yeah, they have. They, you know, it's not only blockchain. They're they're a digital society. Yeah. The passports are digital. All of that. They're fabulous. Yes. Have you been there? No, but I, I read about Estonia with a certain amount of envy. Yeah. And uh, you know they don't speak English that well, so perhaps one day when I can speak Estonian, I'll go there and visit. Do you own any NFTs? I bought an NFT during the, the crazed frenzy of 2020. Um, and what was it? I, I got sucked into the sales talk. It's called, uh, man, it's, it, it, it's, it's a piece of real estate in outer space. It's called Big Time. And uh, I bought it for whatever it was, and now it's one, worth one-tenth of that. And I did it more of an experiment. I didn't spend a lot of money on it because I, I didn't understand the art side of NFTs. But I do have to make a very important point here to your viewers. When you talk about NFTs... Everybody connects it to the digital art that people are buying and selling. You know, the apes or the crypto kitties or right. whatever. Yeah. NFTs have almost nothing to do with art. NFTs is a different thing. Matt Bloomberg is a journalist. Sorry, Matt Levine is a journalist with Bloomberg News. And to, the, to my mind, he's the finest and funniest financial journalist in the world. And he took a look at all of the stuff recently. And he was looking at the NFTs and he finally wrote an article saying, ah, I get it. It's a receipt. All an NFT is, is a digital receipt. It is a digital title deed lodged on a blockchain, immutable, only owned by the person who has the private key, and only can be seen at your discretion by anybody else. And in the same way, it also solves your identity. It also gives you an identity. So NFTs can be applied to the title deed to your house, mm. title, you know, the, the registration to your car, to buy a piece of art, mm. to attach to a real world thing. It's a simple matter to do, to attach to a digital thing. Okay, let me talk about the metaverse, why it's so important. 
the metaverse, which everybody's a bit roly eyed about now, because you know that Facebook changed the name to Meta. And, and yeah, and nothing seems to have happened. Nothing seems to have happened. Well, it's it's actually not true because the Chinese and the Japanese are pouring hundreds of billions into this. The metaverse is not a. Uh, I saw a wonderful quote by the, uh, a right writer on the subject whose name I can't remember right now. He said the metaverse is not a uh, a place. He says it's a time. It's a time when your digital life, the time that you spend online, is more valuable to you than your physical life. Then you are in the metaverse. Then you spend most of your time in the metaverse for dig on a, in, a, in, in the digital world, and you care about it more than your real life. And I know people who are right there now. Metaverse is defined by the fact that you can go in there and you can own stuff. You own stuff via the magic of the NFT. If you go online now, you don't own anything. You spend your day, Matthew, on Google and browsing and searching and email and visiting sites, travel sites or whatever you do, and you spend a whole day and you have a footprint of your day that exists on the internet. You have no ownership of that footprint. You just did it. Guess who has ownership of the footprint? The people search companies. Sell, the yeah. people who sell their footprint to advertisers. Yeah. Metaverse and Web3 allows you property rights via NFTs so that Nobody may use that fit, footprint to make money without your permission or without your or without giving you some money for it, and that's what Web three and Metaverse is all about. So, I mean, um, I suppose you've answered this already, but I mean, what would you say the crypto landscape is going to look like in five years? Yeah, so so the timing issue in crypto is 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 hobbled by regulation on the financial side. So you we've all seen what's happening on regulation. People like. Sam Bankman-Fried did not help matters, as we were chatting about before we started over here. If it wasn't Sam Bankman-Fried, it would have been somebody else. Uh, regulation is there to protect consumers, and one of the things that I have not recovered from, Matt, I, we talked about this earlier since I went down this rabbit hole in 2017, is how many people are prepared to steal without Blinky and the crypto. It's always been thus. It's always been like that. But it's so easy to do in crypto. By the way, it's also very easy to be caught in crypto. So regulation is there to uh, act as a bulwark against crime and theft. And uh, there is a great deal of um, contestation around the world where the right line for that regulation is. You will have seen in 2021, 2022, that regulation come down like a jackboot. And now in the last six months, you're suddenly seeing that regulation starting to open up as policymakers start to understand how transformational and innovative this technology is. And um, do you own any crypto? I do, yeah. I, I put my money where my mouth was, fortunately, in 2017 when prices were still low. And uh, the, so 90% of the stuff that I own is conservative Bitcoin and Ether. And the other 10%, I messed around and lost money on the other 10%. So it's quite strange if you think about that um, that Bitcoin really still is the the big the the and 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 to some extent Ethereum is the big it has been the most uh, it, it it's lasted the longest and it's it's a store of value and it still seems to be that yes Bitcoin is a store became a store of value By the, Satoshi's original vision it was not a store of value it was a payment instrument. And it became a store around Bitcoin. One is called the Lightning Network, which is making it a store of value. And Ethereum, which is kind of like Bitcoin, except it has a programming language sitting at the top of it so people can go out and invent stuff. And it's because of Ethereum that we have NFTs and DAOs and GameFi and Web3 and all of that sort of stuff. They have emerged as the conservative old men of crypto after 13 years. Mm. Most of the other stuff out there, except the stable coins, um, are... If, if you want to invest in them, it's, it's, there's some gambling. You've got to have a high a risk appetite. Yeah. But they have emerged as the most solid of the original cryptocurrencies along with the stable coins, who, which are not volatile. There may be others that emerge, but obviously you can't have 2,000 different cryptocurrencies sustaining forever. I, I, I do want to, before, before we move any further, talk about uh, another area of uh, the blockchain crypto universe, which is the killer use case, which is the one that's not on the newspapers, which is the one that has nothing to do with cryptocurrency. And it's an industry called to tokenization, where you will know from the world of business what securitization was, where you could break up a block of flats into tiny little pieces of shares and sell the shares off. 
Or a plane, or anything. Yes, anything yeah. can be securitized. Lots and lots of paperwork, um, lots and lots of middlemen, lots and lots of people taking fees out and commissions out, etc. Tokenization is the blockchain version of that. We can take a real-world asset, like somebody needs to raise uh, $500 million to build a manufacturing plant in Vietnam, and they go to Goldman Sachs, and they say to Goldman Sachs, I need $500 million. I've been in business for 30 years. I've got good credit. Goldman Sachs then packages that up and puts it on the blockchain, rather than securitizing it with 10,000 lawyers and 50 million pages, and offers it out to retail clients like you and I to get a piece of that manufacturing plant. That was a business that was closed to you and I. It was private debt, and it happened in the back offices of big banks. Now that stuff is opening up to retail investors. According to the Boston Consulting Group and to McKinsey, that business will be worth between, depending which research report you read, between $16 trillion and $30 trillion by 2030. It's all blockchain-based. It's all built into the tokens, the ownership of those assets making it the biggest financial move in history, making cryptocurrencies look small, it will be 10% of GDP will be rolling on crypto rolls by ten, in 10 years. So we'll see, we'll see. But I mean, uh, what, what's the platform and, 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 how, and how is that enabled? Which, which you know, you say, tell, where does it actually... Which, which blockchain does it yeah. run? Okay, so there are a number of them on Ethereum. Uh, there are a number of them on bri private blockchains, and there are some of them on other public blockchains like Solana and a few of them. I was going to ask you about Solana. What uh, is that? Solana is, is, is a blockchain just like any other, but it has a different design approach to Ethereum. It also has a programming language, so it's Ethereum-like in that you can write programs for it. But they took the view that there, there is a thing called the trilemma dilemma. Okay, It's a triangle that you can either be secure or you can have Lots of transactions a second, which is scalability, or you can be decentralized, okay? And you can't be all three. You can only choose two. Mm. That wasn't somebody's opinion. It was proved by, it's proved by the mathematics. Solana chose to be fast and be less decentralized. Ethereum chose to be slower and more decentralized. So it's simply a design, de design decision. There are lots and lots and lots of technologies now that are trying to solve the trilemma dilemma, including best developers on the world working on the Ethereum platform to bring it up to a million transactions per second, which will be about uh, 50 times faster than Visa. Okay. There's a lot of people in the world that don't have identities or are said to not have identities. What can be done about them? So crypto represents probably the greatest opportunity for financial inclusion ever. You can't open a bank account without that stuff. Not even if you do have that stuff, if you've only got 100 rand, you can't open a bank account. So you, the, there is a large exclusion that happens in traditional legacy institutions. The paperwork, the KYC, the passports, the ID books, the enough money, all of that stuff, credit. You've got hundreds of millions, I think it's even more than that, it may be into billions of people who don't have that stuff. You require none of that stuff to open a blockchain. Absolutely none. You require only proof that you're alive, and in, in some cases, not even that. In some cases, bots can do it, although that's fast disappearing. As has happened in India, you require a thumbprint and somebody to tell you alive, and you can now have a Bitcoin account or an Ethereum account. Now, one may say, well, if you don't have documentation and you've been excluded from society, you're not going to have the technological sophistication to do any of this, so, so why this, this doesn't work. Not true. When El Salvador, who legalized Bitcoin a year or two back, and they put a wallet on a cell phone. And people said, well, you know, people don't understand this crypto stuff. Well, 60% of the population uses the Chavo wallet, which is a crypto. So it's, that's going well? Yes, it's going well. It's going better and better and better. There is more acceptance of Bitcoin as, a, as legal tender. People are going there and buying a loaf of bread at the equivalent of their sponsor shop in it. It's been an enormous success. Yeah, every and if you, in every couple of months you see someone say that you know people can now buy the items at pick and pay or checkers with with crypto. It's the, the adoption is still very very low here. Uh, you know, uh, it was Oscar Wilde or one of those guys who said it's slowly, 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 and then not okay. And I think it was the, uh, referring to going bankrupt. How did you go bankrupt? Slowly, <laughs> slowly, 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 and then suddenly. So, so the adoption of, of, of crypto is, is going to follow the same path, just, just like the internet, by the way. The internet 1995, when, when I got in business doing internet-type stuff, 
Nobody gave a damn about the internet, and then all of a sudden it exploded out. Cell phones, the same thing, first BlackBerry and then the iPhone. All of this stuff is very slow until it crosses some sort of a phase transition, which is a word from physics, where everybody suddenly sees how important this is or how much cheaper or more efficiently or quicker they can do something if they only use this technology versus another technology. So I have no doubt that adoption is approaching not decades away, years away, a point where this thing explodes onto societies and gives um, benefit to humanity. It's a public goodness. It's cheaper, it's faster, it's more secure. Yes, people will make fortunes along the way and the wrong people may make fortunes, but at the bottom line, this stuff is going to have some benefits. So we're talking, uh, and just a prediction, I mean, are you between five and ten years, would you say? Yeah, I think I think in ten years from now, all payments is on blockchain. In fact, Visa just announced two weeks ago that five hundred thousand of their merchants merchants are going to be settled on blockchain. <laughs> what happens now when you go into Bitcoin Pay and you use your credit card? Let's say you're from Armenia, some third world country, right? It's got to go back there and come back. It's got to go back to there. So the, the merchants get paid two, three days later, sometimes a week later. Yeah. Uh, Visa's doing a pilot now with a stable coin called USDC in which the merchants get paid five seconds after the transaction. Now, there are no losers in that equation except except for people who hold that money along the way when it used to take three days. To... So that's instant settlement. Instant settlement. That's one of the great advantages of, of the block. Well, um, uh, we'll I'll, I'll check back with you in uh, five years to see if I was right. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks very much, Stephen. Been a great Thank pleasure. You. And if you haven't already, I'd like to invite you to subscribe to ITWeb's YouTube channel.